Welcome to Unit 5, Lecture 2, Encoding. This has the potential to be a very long lecture, so I'm going to try to just do a couple examples for everything, and we can talk about it more in class and practice it more in class. Um, the good news, so that's the bad news, is that there's a lot. The good news is that the terms aren't terribly difficult, so I think you'll catch on really quickly. There's only one learning target, not too bad. But let's get into what is encoding. This is the idea of getting information into our memories, into our mind, into our consciousness. So not necessarily our actual physical brain, although that is, of course, of course, part of this. We'll talk about that more in the next lecture. But how do we get these mental representations into our consciousness, into our cognitive system in a way that we can understand it? So we don't actually have a physical picture of this puppy in our brains, just like we learned in our vision section. We don't actually open up our brains, put in a picture of Darth Vader, and then know who Darth Vader is. Um, it takes it takes a processing of an idea um, in order to understand it and keep it and retain it. So first of all, many, many ideas are automatically processed into our brain. An enormous amount of information is processed very, very easily, and it takes no effort. We'll come back to that word, no effort at all. Things like space, oh, that, that car accident happened right by my house the other day. Or um, I remember where I left my cup, I left it in the bathroom, I better go get it, um, that sort of thing. Time, um, remembering what order perhaps you did something in. Like, uh, oh yeah, so this morning, let's see, I woke up and then I did some yoga and then I wrote an email and then I finally had my coffee. I didn't, that is my actual morning. I didn't have to put any effort into remembering that. I can just pause, think for a second, and poof, there it is. Um, time also could refer to, oh yeah, it must have been about two o'clock that I saw that car accident because I left school and it was on my way home and I know I leave school at 1.45. So any sort of um, noting the time or order of events. Frequency, keeping track of how often things happen or a quantity of something like, oh, I ate four pieces of pizza or, hey, I just split those chicken nuggets with you and we got a 10 piece and I think I had four, so I think I get one more. Um, but it also could be something um, across an entire lifetime. Like, I know I have had seven cars in my life, not because I little, literally am counting like, oh, this is car number seven, but because I can think back to how many, which ones they were and poof, there it is in my memory. So you don't necessarily have to repeat these memories to yourself over and over or put a lot of effort into them. They just happen to be there. Conversely, effortful processing is when you do need to make that effort. You need to consciously try to remember something. This applies to novel, in other words, new and unique information, and it takes effort and rehearsal to retain this information. However, the more you study, the more you review, the more you practice, the more you go over and over and try when you're learning something, not try to remember it later, but like you actually tell yourself in the process of learning, like, I need to remember this. This is really important. Um, it makes those memories durable. In other words, long lasting and accessible. Like you'll be able to pull them out of your mind later. So over learning is a real thing and it's a real strategy for memory. The more effort you put into learning something and telling yourself, this is important. I really need to focus. I really need to understand. Um, the more likely you are to build a permanent memory or a relatively permanent memory. Um, something like eating what you had for lunch, automatic processing, you can probably pull it back pretty quickly in your mind. Um, but something like learning from a textbook that takes focus and concentration. Still based on these ideas of automatic and effortful processing, um, these two psychologists, Craig and Tolving, actually conducted their research on levels of processing. And they came up with these concepts that fall under the idea of like shallow processing um, and only kind of catching that uh, memory really quickly and then deep processing and trying to keep a memory with you for a long, long time. These two are uh, shallow processing and they are also examples of sensory memory. So those quick instantaneous memories. Uh, iconic or visual encoding is information you learn just by looking at it. Uh, for example, we blink like 14,000 times a day, but every time you blink, the world doesn't go dark. And that's because our sensory memory is holding onto that visual image that was just there and filling in that gap. Um, it's also been determined that visualization is a way to make your memories stronger. If you think back on a trip to Disney World, even though it might have been hot and 
Uh, maybe you were really hungry because it was a long day. You're more likely to visualize the memory in terms of the colorful balloons and the beautiful castles and the fun rides. Um, and so your visual, your visualizing something makes your memory stronger. Echoic or acoustic encoding is information that goes into your memory when you hear it. So imagine your dad's going on and on, but you're not really paying attention. Then all of a sudden he says, wait, what did I say? And you're like, uh, that we're about to leave the house and I better get ready. And they're like, hmm, okay, you got me this time. But he probably went on and on and on. You just caught the last couple words because your sensory memory of um, your auditory memory happened to have latched on to just that. But if he asks you more questions further back into what he said, that might not be there. Um, when things have a rhythm to them or sound unique or special, we're more likely to remember them. So if you think of a cliche like an apple a day keeps the doctor away, there's a good rhythm there, you're more likely to remember that phrase. Um, our echoic encoding is better for numbers than letters. If you're trying to remember a series of, of letters, uh, there's some difficulty because letters like B and D and C all sound similar. So if you have to memorize them in the, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know why you would, but if you do, um, those are going to be harder. Whereas if you remember your number, if you have to remember a series of numbers, particularly one through 10, they're, they do not sound the same. And so you're more likely to pick out each unique number in whatever it's presented to you. Semantic encoding, on the other hand, is deeper encoding. It's deep level of processing. Elaborate, meaningful pieces of information elicit better recall. In other words, the more effort, just like we talked about before, the more effort you put into forming a meaning behind information, the more likely you are to remember it. So if you put it into context, if you connect it to other experiences, if it helps you interpret and understand that information um, better, you're more likely to remember it. Another example might be using an image to demonstrate a point. If I just told you that tanning and smoking were bad for you, you'd be like, yeah, yeah okay, I'll remember that. But if I then backed it up with a visual like this, which I got from WebMD that demonstrates the harmful nature of tanning and smoking, you might be like, well, okay, so it's not just something she said, like, I've got visual evidence and you're more likely to remember that point later. This goes hand in hand with copying notes versus thinking about what you're, what I'm saying or what you're reading and then choosing what to write down. If you are just a robot copying what you see on the screen or copying what you read in a textbook, you are less likely to, to find it meaningful later and you're not gonna remember that information. But if you read a little bit, stop and think. If you copy a little bit, stop and think or put it in your own words and not just write like automatically, you're more likely to remember it. Think of a, a song that helps you, that every time you hear it, you remember a special event. I think about the song, um, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. Before I got married, it was just a nice song. And then when my dad and I had to pick a song to dance to at my wedding, we thought about the fact that we both love the Beach Boys. That's a beautiful song with a beautiful message. And now every time I hear that song, I think of this moment with my dad. So, what I'd like you to do with that example is I'd like you to think of a personal song that you connect with a personal event and don't write down um, an example is Miss Russ dances with her dad at her wedding. Think of something you can connect to because that is called a self-referencing effect. I'll go back to that slide in a second. You are more likely to remember something when you create a personal meaning for it and not necessarily somebody else's meaning for something. So again, instead of writing down my memory in terms of associating a song with an event, write down some song that you can associate with an event in your life. This is an example of a memory effect. So something that might make a memory stronger or weaker. Okay, so when encoding possibly doesn't go well, it's usually because of a memory effect. Um, Self-referencing is a pretty strong one. This is considered one of the best effects to make a memory stronger. But uh, these next couple have positives and negatives to them. So the next in line effect is when you have good recall for what others say, but poor recall for the person who spoke just in front of you in line. In, in Not in line, like standing in a line, but like in order. So 
let's say that you have to answer questions for a teacher and she's going up and down the rows and so you might hear what the first person says and what the second person says but as soon as it's the person right in front of you you might not remember what they say because you're too busy thinking about what you're about to say so you've got good recall for what other people said but not that person that came right in front of you you have a flawed memory there spacing you have good recall when rehearsal studying is distributed spread out over time but not if you mass cram you try to learn everything at once this is called distributed practice as well so if you space out or distribute out your practice your studying your rehearsal of information you are more likely to remember it compared to if you try to learn or retain everything um, at once and then finally serial position is another example where you have good recall for one thing but not for another so you might have good recall for the fast first and last items on a list or a set of information but then poor for the middle items on a list this could be your grocery list or remembering your kindergarten teacher and your senior year teachers but maybe not so much some of those middle teachers that you had or if you have to list off all the presidents you can probably get george washington and probably obama and trump but can you name the 27th president? If you're not Miss Tulski, chances are no, you can't. Um, so this also is known as the primary and recency effect. So if all of those are things that make our memory good sometimes and flawed other times, what can we do to actually bolster our memory more often? We can use mnemonic devices. And mnemonic devices are essentially memory tricks um, that use vivid imagery, to aid your memory. They are effortful and they take effort and they are usually, you're usually constructing some sort of memory. Sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's not. Um, so visualization, effort, and making meaning out of information, those are some of the things we've already talked about that make memories stronger. For the sake of not having this video go on too long, I'm going to define these four mnemonic devices, but, and I will briefly go over how they work but we'll do them in class because it will be more meaningful if we do. The first one we need to learn is the method of loci. Uh, I like to refer to it by its more common name, Memory Palace. If you've ever seen Sherlock Holmes, um, he uses Memory Palaces. I've seen it in other movies and things like that. But it's the idea that you imagine yourself moving through a place you know very, very well. So like a place you've been before or that you're at a lot, like school or your bedroom or your house, and you place, you visualize, you mentally place these things that you need to remember in order in different places as you walk through a location and you're able to um, later on go through that same walk and hopefully remember that same set of information. Peg word is the next mnemonic device, and this is when you memorize a poem or a little song. And yes, I know it's weird you have to memorize something in order to make your memory better, um, but stay with me. It's when you memorize a poem or a little song and then you try to associate it with a list of information you need to remember. It again works best if you can visualize it. So you might memorize this little poem which is fairly common. One bun, two is shoe, three is tree, four is door, and so on. If you get some sort of poem like this, you're using the same poem every time but with a different set of lists or a different set of information that you need to remember in the immediate future. For example, your grocery list. If you need to remember milk, scotch tape, and a light bulb, maybe you would picture one is bun, I'm gonna picture pouring milk on my shoe. Yeah, that's, or not milk on my shoe, sorry. <laughs> milk on my bun. Like that's a weird image, but I could probably remember dumping milk on a bun. Two is shoe. So I'm gonna to remember to like tape my shoe together. I'm gonna to picture that I have to tape the bottom of the shoe to the top because my shoe is falling apart. Uh, three is tree. I'm going to picture a tree with light bulbs hanging down and I can just grab the light bulbs off like they're oranges. Got it. Okay. Jump ahead an hour. Now I'm at the grocery store. I can remember the song that I already know. One bun, two shoe, three tree. And now I can maybe picture that funny image with the bun pouring milk on it. With the shoe taping it up. With the tree pulling off those light bulbs. Bada bing. A week later, I got to go to the grocery store again. I use the same jingle, but now I visualize a different set of information. Third is the link or hierarchies method. And this is when you form a mental image of items to are remembered in a way that links them together. 
this could be um, actually like piling your things together. Like here, I've got some clip art, but let me go back to that milk scotch tape and light bulb thing. Maybe instead of the pegboard method, I picture a gallon of milk with a light bulb on, on top and the opening of the milk, and I picture taping it up. So I've got this funny image. I go to the store, I can picture my funny image and all of its pieces, and all of a sudden I remember my grocery list. More commonly um, is something like a flow chart or categorizing or a graphic organizer. So we have all these memory concepts that we need to learn. I'm not going to ask you to memorize it at this second, but if we can break them down into categories like these two go with this thing, these two go with this thing, and so on, you are more likely to remember it later. The fourth mnemonic device I want to focus on is chunking, and this is when you organize items into familiar, manageable units. So try to remember, if you had to remember these numbers on the right, would you? One, seven, seven, six, one, four, nine, one, eight, one, two, one, nine, four, one. There is no good reason for you to remember all of those numbers. However, if you make them meaningful and you are well versed with American history, you could probably chunk those numbers and recall all of them. We'll see. I'm not. I'm not going to reveal what they how that works and what they all are right now. But we'll see in class if you can chunk them in a more meaningful way. Chunking also applies to acronyms or acrostics. So an acronym uh, specifically is when you use initials to form silly words, and an acrostic is when you use um, initials to form silly sentences. So, for example, uh, PEMDAS is probably the one that's pretty familiar to you. It's the order of operations in math. PEMDAS is not actually a word, um, though Holmes is, so it can be an actual word, but it's usually something that you could at least say and you could spell because then those initials trigger in your memory, parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. Um, an example of a silly sentence might be, my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. It stands for the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so on. If you know it, you know it. So you can make silly sentences, acrostics, or silly words, acronyms, using initials of a list or a group of information, and you are likely to be able to memorize that. So what should you remember about making memories? In other words, how do you remember your memory materials? I feel like there's a little spiral in that thought process. Um, when it's new, challenging, difficult, important information, it takes effort. Some of the easy stuff we automatically remember. Um, we are more likely to remember something if we visualize it, if we give it meaning, specifically personal meaning, and if we rehearse and repeat that information over and over and over. Okay, there's one more chunk to this lecture. We will be going over it in class. I'm going to make a different YouTube video for that one. Um, so if you miss it in class, watch the other part of this video, the Unit 5 Lecture 2 Part 2. Um, but if you miss that, yeah, so if you miss that part of class, watch that YouTube video. If you're going to be in class, you can probably skip that video. That made sense, right? <laughs>